Hello. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we're, as Kristen said, we're going to be talking about the business of screenwriting today. And we brought three very special guests to discuss that. And I think it's interesting because they come from three different sort of disciplines. We have uh, an emerging writer, a former student alum, uh, Dan Willis. Uh, Dan, uh, are you coming out? Yeah, come on up, Dan. So Dan uh, was, uh, yeah. Dan worked in development at Disney and then now is currently working for Grey's Anatomy. So it would be great to hear Dan's story. We also have uh, Sarah Rostogi. Sarah is in development uh, at uh, Scott Free Productions. That's Ridley Scott's production company, so sort of the development side of things. And then we have Lenny Beckerman, uh, who is a manager and producer, uh, who's come as well. So, so, uh, <laughs> right. so um, I think to start off with, uh, just to give an overview of what you all are currently doing, just so we understand your roles before we get into discussing the business of screenwriting. Sure. Uh, right now I have a production company in Hollywood. I represent writers and directors um, and put financing and packaging together for certain projects uh, as an independent producer as well. Um, I'm a junior executive at Scott Free, which basically um, my job provides support to our more senior executives. Um, but they're really great in that um, giving us a voice in terms of the creative. So we read a lot of up and coming writers and then um, also helping package and sell our the scripts that we're passionate about. Awesome. Uh, I spend most of my time in Los Angeles working in development, um, both at Walt Disney Motion Pictures and a company called Good Universe. But as of Monday, I started working on a, a show called Grey's Anatomy. So I've been there for five days uh, as a writer's PA. So I can talk a little bit about that. Great. Well, why don't we start off, I think most of the writers in the room will want to know, and we can, Lenny and Sarah can talk about this, but what do you guys look for? What do you look for in a script when it comes in? What sort of attracts you to a well, project and separates it from all the other scripts out there? I think the most important thing is when you look at a project that you're looking to write or, you know, is, is it producible, right? So that to me is, th that to me is the million dollar question when you look at a script. The, the, the thing is that you don't want to write something that can't get made. And so there's certain rules about what can get made and what cannot get made. You have an understanding of you only have a certain amount of time in your life or my life or anybody's life in, in, in the aspect of trying to get a movie made, right? So you try to do something that gets you closer, right? So a 12-person ensemble is going to be difficult, right? Because now all these actors are going to have to share screen time and all that sort of stuff. So you try to do movies that have a male lead, right? That's probably the first step that's a little easier. A male lead because more males, males go see other males in movies, females go see other males in movies, and there's a whole laundry list of men, actors, that could quantify a certain budgetary range. You also try to do something that the international marketplace could understand, right? So comedies, for instance, well, you know, if you try to try to show a comedy in France and it's dubbed in their language, the interpretation of that comedy starts to get, you know, doesn't really work. So you, thrillers, horror movies, something that, you know, action that the international marketplace understands. So what I look for in movies or help guide writers is, is this film producible? You know, it, and you try to put it into a box. Now, inside that box, you want to try to make sure that you know, there's great characters, there's great dialogue, there's, you know, the script stands out, but you still try to put into a main, uh, 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 you try to put into a place where it makes it easier for somebody to say yes. Yeah, and on, in addition to all of that, I think something that's really important is to, for the script itself to showcase the writer's voice. Um, because so many times, like, you get movies that are trying to be a big blockbuster and it just kind of reads like you, you read a book on how to write this. But I, like, we want to see what makes it different from all of the movies that are out there like that. So if you're writing, you know, a big action comedy, what's your specific edge on that? Why should we, you know, buy your script or hire you versus, you know, the thousands of others? So it, there, you should maintain some sort of individuality as well. So Dan, you worked as a reader too for Disney. So what sort of projects were you instructed to kind of look for, especially at a company like Disney where they're, you know, usually looking for much 
broader mm -hmm. films rather than characters and stuff? Well, I've been I've been lucky to work at like well branded companies. So even before Disney, I was at Overbrook Entertainment, which was Will Smith's company. They make a certain kind of movie there, movies that are vehicles for him specifically. So that was kind of the mandate to say, does this work for Will? Does this work for the Smith family in particular? At Disney, Disney's a narrow target, right? So they want big, broad family ideas, um, but only certain things can go under the Disney banner. Um, and then even at Good Universe, which is a company that's rebranded from Mandate, so they made films like Juno and 5050, they're looking for like character driven, kind of smaller, what they call art martial fair. So things that uh, can have the potential to have bigger box office. Um, what I would say is you should be targeted in how you approach companies and know your audience, you know? Um, certain movies will work at Warner Brothers that will never work at Disney. And you should think about those things, um, you know, as you're thinking about you know, potential homes for your, for your screenplays. Mm -hmm. uh, so just know what they're looking for, know what they've done in the past and what they might be trying to do uh, in the next few years. Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to sort of, you know, tailor your script in advance for a mm -hmm. specific company, but it's always good to be mindful of what the current state of the industry is, right? Because if you have a certain type of movie that just isn't commercial in any way, shape, or form, it's obviously going to be hard to find a home for that. I, I, think, I think working in the studio system is, is tough for emerging writers today mm -hmm. because what, what it is is that intellectual property is king, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, David Heyman's a great example of a guy who, you know, found his book in, you know, London, paid $25,000 for an option, and it's Harry Potter, right? So now it's a $25 billion uh, franchise. So he got in the ground floor as a producer with the book, right? But as a young writer or an emerging writer, you're not going to get, you're not going to have the opportunity to have access to that type of material unless you have money. So, so what you try to do is, me personally, when I tell writers, I go, don't try to write Harry Potter because that movie will not get made because they need to know that if they're going to put $200 million into a movie, there's already a groundswell of audience out there for that movie. So. Don't write the sci-fi huge epic. Write a movie like Moon, for example. Sam Rockwell, right? Contained, smart, intelligent movie that could be made for a price. Then off that movie, which has a great sci-fi voice to it, you might get the writing assignment to adapt a book that has the intellectual property that Warner Bros. might make. I mean, it, Sarah, this is something we were kind of talking about, but there's this major separation between these huge blockbuster, you know, $200 million movies and then the much smaller character driven, but micro budget's probably not the right term, but you know, like <laughs> 10, 15, $20 million movie. And there, those movies that used to exist in that in between 50 to $70 million budgets are almost non-existent these days, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as the business changes, that, that space might kind of reemerge mm -hmm. because now it, you know the business is largely about risk aversion and so as those 200 million dollar movies sometimes don't underperform um, you know and you kind of it's like let's minimize that risk so I think that space might reopen in my personal opinion um, over the next couple of years but right now I think for young writers and young filmmakers it's it's more important to establish who you are as a filmmaker and who you are as a writer and get people excited about what you can what the potential that exists rather than, you know, trying to fit into a mold basically. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I think we can get to and this is probably more in Lenny's area but I think we all have experience with this too is just I think a lot of writers have this sort of misconception about representation, agents and managers, and that once you secure an agent or a manager that you can just sort of sit back and collect paychecks. And that it's, you know, it's like your work is done, you've got that rep that's going to now take your script out there. But maybe just talk about a little bit more what the role of a manager is, because I think it's sort of unclear for a lot of people about what exactly does a manager do as opposed to an agent and what's the benefit of having either. Well, I, I, I used to represent this client for a long time and he came to me uh, he just quit his law job, his wife had a baby on the way, and he had this dream of being a screenwriter. So he came to me and of course he had that 12 person ensemble going to a wedding type movie that you know I said hey there's nothing I could do for you here with this script. However your characters are amazing you know 
you really, you know, you not only write great male characters, great, great female characters, and they're so grounded, let's develop something, let's, let's develop something. So come back to me, pitch me three ideas, right? So he pitched me three ideas, and uh, one of them was uh, no strings attached, right? And we took it from outline stage to draft stage, we did a bunch of drafts with it, and then we got a preemptive offer from MGM back in the day. And uh, he, at that point, he's on his way. So what I do specifically is that I try to help writers understand what is marketable, what is producible. And then I try to navigate the waters of who to take it to, when to take it to, and, uh, and do it that way. You know, another good example, Gary Goldman, who wrote Total Recall, and uh, was the first writer on Minority Report. He was in a rut. Uh, he was kind of, you know, high-end money writer that wasn't getting jobs. And, you know, and I signed him at that time, and I said, hey, let's go back to the well, you know? You did Total Recall, you did Minority Report. Uh, let's go after uh, property. Let's go after the Philip K. Dick property. We went after that, you know, uh, a, you know a short story that he liked, and I helped him option it with the estate, and he wrote a draft. We did many drafts of that thing, but once we finished it, we felt really good about it. I said, you know what, there's two ways we could do this. We could go try to sell the movie and get X amount of dollars, or we could go attach a big star or a director and we get double or triple the amount of money. And uh, we were able, you know, I, took it, I took the script into uh, CAA at the time, and uh, we got Nick Cage. Nick Cage was coming off uh, National Treasure at the time, and he was, you know, being hot again. We attached him, and I sold that script for, you know, one verse 2.5 million. And uh, the movie got made. It was called Next. It was a terrible movie. Jessica Biel and Nick Cage, but <laughs> I didn't direct it. So, but, but the right. <laughs> But the writer made out, you know, that's the thing. He made out and all of a sudden his career re-energized because we went to an intellectual property and, and I knew how to get this guy back on track. So I, you know, I'm a guiding voice, I'm a developer, I'm a packager, and I'm a marketer and seller. Take a, a more of a producing role, right? Whereas opposed well, the, to an agent who was really just... Well, these days you gotta, you know, because what happened is that, you know, back in the day, a great script, a great idea you could throw out there and all these studios would bid and overbid and do that. Uh, these days, you know, they, they got pinched by having all these scripts in development and nothing to do with it, uh, nothing to do with them, especially when a new regime showed up. So now the studios are a little smarter and saying, okay, well, if I have this director attached or I have this actor attached, then the likelihood of getting it made would, is is better. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a lot of heavy lifting. I was attaching directors. I was attaching actors. And so I was doing the producer's jobs for them. And so since I started doing that, I was like, well, it's time for me to kind of throw my hat in the ring and start producing more. Um, with big studio stuff, I go into big producers at the studio, 600 pound gorillas, and I'm the baby producer. But when it comes to smaller stuff, independence, you know, I develop the screenplay, option stuff, get, you know, find the financing, farm pre-sales, whatever, to get a movie made. So that's, that's the new business model that I'm in. And Sarah, what, what is your relationship with the managers and agents at Scott Free? I mean, you're dealing with them probably every day, right? Yeah, sure. every day. Um, they're constantly bringing us material. And um, because we are a pretty specific company, we look for, obviously, big worlds, um, strong characters, et cetera. Um, you know, we don't have an onslaught of submissions. And so a lot of times, like, we'll, the agents will, like, pitch and repitch the same writers who, who work in sort of our bubble. Um, and it can sometimes be about bringing us new ideas and not actually a finished script. Um, following up, like, it's constant following up and be like, oh, well, they've changed this, so let's take another look at it. Um, and sometimes I kind of see an, uh, agents and managers as like bodyguards. You know, even when we do get involved with a writer, they're always looking out for, you know, not only their best interests, but their writer's best interests and making sure that they're not being taken advantage of doing free work. Um, you know, so they're, they're really there to help, I think, as well as, you know, make some cash. Do you notice a difference between working with producers or agents or just, I mean, I'm sorry, managers or agents, or is it essentially the same, do you feel? You know, it depends who you sign with. Mm -hmm. I think there are some agents um, on, you know, at smaller companies that 
are really invested and creative, and then there are other ones who are like, okay, you don't like that one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the person, and I think um, young writers and filmmakers should be smart about who they sign with um, and where they sign, because some, you know, CAA is the big gold standard, and everyone wants to be at CAA, but are they gonna give you the attention and the nurturing that you need? And same thing with a manager. You know, there are these huge management companies, um, but they may not be able to devote the time to you. So for me, I like dealing with people who have the creative in the best interest um, and who can kind of determine what my, not only what my taste is and bring me material that suits me, but that also suits our company. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, it, it's kind of a personal choice and relationship and, you know, everyone deals with people constantly that they're friends with. It's a very mm -hmm. social business. And so most of the agents and managers that we deal with, we have great relationships with and, you know, it's an easy transaction. It's easy, it's fun business. So Dan, as an emerging writer, have mm -hmm. you tried to sought out, to seek out representation at all? And can you talk about that experience that you had? I haven't. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I got some, uh, some good advice. I was at a panel like this one um, when I first got to LA and they were talking, there was like, you know, um, uh, a representative um, from all the major agencies and a couple of the management companies and they were talking about not seeking representation so like go out and make something awesome you know write a great script you know exp you know send it around your network and let us come find you and that's the best way to do it and I think that's true and that's been um, the experience of a lot of my friends who have made that jump to the next level um, you want, I, I feel, representation to seek you out because they see something that's special about you that they want to advocate for. Um, and that's important because when we're talking about a business based on relationships, we talk to the same agents and managers every day pretty much. And when they get excited about somebody, that can make the difference if that script is going to make it to my boss this weekend read. You know, so you want someone who wants you specifically, uh, and that's someone who just wants to kind of put you in your pocket until you do something cool. And how do you think you get to that? What, what, what do you need to do as a writer to get to that? Is it just having an original <laughs> voice? Is it having, you know? I think it's getting your work read, and I think that starts with your, your network, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been an assistant for the last few years and a lot of things can start at that level. It's like you want Hollywood assistants to be reading your work uh, and you have it happen by having relationships. You know, when, you know, submissions come into our company, they, they basically come to me, you know, unless they're like a high level project, then I'm going to kind of vet and filter some of that material for our company and say, hey, this is something that we need to be involved with, or this is a writer that you should know. And that happens at agencies and management companies as well. Um, so having people who can advocate for your writing can make the difference uh, in you getting that meeting or getting on that you know, roster. Mm -hmm. Well, I miss mean, kind of segue to that, but I think another important skill set for writers to have is the ability to pitch, right? Mm -hmm. And so we want to talk about maybe the importance of pitching and why that's because uh, I think too a lot of writers have a hard time with it because it's a relatively solitary sort of position. Then you're forced to go in a room in front of potentially very powerful individuals who have the ability to maybe you know purchase your your material and then having to be able to verbally communicate your idea that may have taken you two or three years to, <laughs> to write in, in a short amount of time, you know? To, uh, absolutely. You know. I mean, especially in television. Mm -hmm. You know, television, you have a great script, but that's not the show you're trying to sell. So you have to go in there and you've got to be a showman. I mean, I've seen, I've seen great writers not sell stuff because they didn't know how to pitch, and I've seen great pitchers sell tons of stuff, but they didn't know how to write. <laughs> So, you, so what you do is try to partner those guys up somehow, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an acquired, acquired talent. And I think, you know, rehearsing, rehearsing, and, and I, I do that a lot with a lot of my clients where they come in and we go through pitches and we rehearse, rehearse. And now, you know, visuals are very important, you know, uh, ha, you know, taking the time to put references together, putting a lookbook together and being able to get in a room and show them what you're trying to say. A lot of filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers now who try to get jobs uh, to direct movies, uh, they'll put a reel together of references or they'll go shoot something and, and it's an investment in trying to get a job. So that, that's, you know, that's an acquired taste, uh, acquired uh, talent. However, at the end of the day, writers write. 
right? So if you're not a good pitcher and you don't claim to be one, write it because you'll get read. So, you know, there's a lot of guys or, or a lot of writers, women, men, they'll, be, they'll write a great script and they'll go pitch the whole year and not sell anything. And they wasted a year because they're hoping somebody pays them to write it. But at the end of the day, writers write, so just write. And I'm sure, Sarah, you hear a lot of pitches. What are some common mistakes you think that writers make when pitching projects? Um, you know, I found that a lot of development executives are sort of failed writers. <laughs> um, and they just kind of got <laughs> ushered into the development track, or maybe it's the agency track. Um, and, you know, they kind of, the people you're pitching to want to feel a part of your idea. And so a lot of times people come in and just boom, run through their pitch, no air, no like <laughs> lag time for a response or for questions. And I think to make it an engaging experience, like, you know, have some leeway to, to open up the conversation to the people who are listening is really important because then they can invest in your idea and start kind of pitching you on where they think it's going. And also being able to think on your feet. There are some people who are posed a question and they freeze mm -hmm. because they've they've practiced and they've rehearsed and having you know being able to be fluid and you know know your story backwards and forwards to the point where you can defend it to where you can modify it you know you just have to be prepared confident but also a little bit humble I think so that you can kind of play with the people in the room a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to add anything? And I think knowing your audience is a huge thing, and you know that's something that you can you can research people online. But also, as you start to you know know people, you can you know reach re research them kind of by talking to people that they know. And a lot of times, you know, as pitches like elevate at the companies that I work for, we've actually worked with writers to develop their pitches so that when we put them in the room with the higher level executive, they can give the best version of it. And that comes from building those relationships with people and having people who want you to succeed. Um, so that, that's helpful as well. So um, none of us, I don't think, are originally from Los Angeles, but at some point, all I mean, currently you three flew in from LA, uh, and I lived there for a while too, but so maybe we can talk about like what is the importance of Los Angeles? Why is that such a central place for the industry. I mean, obviously it's the heart of the entertainment industry, but why is it so key for writers to at least be engaged with LA? Well, I, th I think, you know, you're, you're going to be walking around Los Angeles and you're going to run into or meet somebody that could help you mm -hmm. do something, you know? Unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, every other city, you know, New York's also a small, you know, small film business there, but in LA, you could throw a rock and hit a writer, an actor, a director, <laughs> anywhere. And so, you know, you go to a dinner party, you go to, uh, you, and, and so you get into these conversations, and all of a sudden you're collaborating with somebody, or, or hey, I'd love to read your script, a screenplay. I'd you know, I'd love to take a meeting with you. And so I think, it's, I think it's important to get your stuff read by being out there. You know, me personally, I bought a one-way ticket on my birthday and ended up in <laughs> L.A., and and uh, figured, you know, if I want to do this, I got to be there, you know. However, it's not impossible to write a screenplay and, you know, you know go out there for a couple of weeks, try to, do so try to do something and get somebody to advocate your screenplay and see what happens. But if you really, if you really want to, you know, do this, you, you know, you got to roll the dice and bank on yourself and go out there for at least a year and try to get something going. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I would add, too, is that um, I do think there's a benefit to having some distance from L.A. as well, of being able to sort of refine your voice as a writer, because I think there's been many writers who will just, like, maybe even after high school, will just head out there and try to make a go of it. And if you're not ready, I think that can have a really negative impact on your career. So I do think there's a benefit to really developing your voice also, also having a solid portfolio. Yeah, also over. having uh, life experience, you know? Yeah. I mean, nothing worse than going to L.A. and then writing a screenplay about the film business <laughs> or the TV business. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, you know? But, you know, but, you know so you got to write something that you know, which is great, and if all you know is L.A., then it's going to be tough. Uh, so, you know, my feeling is that you know, a great example is, you know, No Country for Old Men, you know, the, the, the author of that movie, uh, of that book, you know, he lives in, you know, where he writes, and that's, a, that's important, and, and 
it's good to have a voice that way. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, distancing yourself from LA is very important in your writing, not in the selling of your writing. Mm -hmm. Then you want to talk about your journey to LA? And yeah. And from, as from DePaul, how did you get there? It's how so crazy. <laughs> my, my first class in film school was in this room, and I was sitting up in that corner. <laughs> I remember very clearly, it was five years ago. Um, I went here for graduate school. They created this program while I was there, the LA Quarter, uh, which allowed me to go out to Los Angeles and do an internship. And I think the upside of being in LA is access, really. I mean, assuming you're working on your craft and you're becoming a, a better writer, it only matters if you can get people to read your work. So the internships that I did and the jobs that I've had allow me to get access to rooms and to people. You know, there are people when I have something that I feel is excellent, which is the best version of what I can do, I can call them and I can get a meeting with them. And that matters, you know. Um, that's very, it's, it's, it can be an intimidating space, it can be a, a tough nut to crack, um, but that's the difference in like having a great script and then making that script into a movie. Um, so I don't think it's necessary that you go right away, I don't think it's necessary that um, everyone, you know, makes it their goal to live in Los Angeles full time but it's definitely gonna give you a step up if you're there, if you're present, uh, if you're building your network. And when I say that, I just mean making a lot of friends and knowing people at the agencies and knowing people at the, at the production companies uh, and keeping up with them when you're ready uh, and when you have something that's special, you can get eyes on it. Do you want anything? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that when you make the decision to move and when you start showing people um, your work that you are not only you know prepared with that script and it's strong, but you also have ideas that you can pitch and toss back and forth. Because the worst thing to do is to walk into a meeting, to walk into a room, have your one script and nothing else to talk about. Because maybe that script isn't something the company would produce. Maybe it's too small, maybe it's not the right genre, but you need to have other ideas. And so you don't want to waste those opportunities. So if it takes you a year after school to kind of get prepared to make the move and start taking those meetings, then do that and in the process you can enter, you know, there's a thousand screenwriting competitions that people in Hollywood actively pay attention to. Um, you know, Blacklist, The Nickel, all of these things, people really pay attention. Like mm -hmm. we circulate the lists of the winners. Here are the top 15 writers that came out of this contest. And we, and we do read them. So, you know, there are ways to get exposure without being in the city, but to really make it happen, it is important to be there. Yeah, I think, um, too, you kind of were touching on contests and things, but um, something I think that's important for emerging writers to get more attention is to generate this sort of heat behind their, their work or their projects. And do you have any tips for how to go? I mean, obviously, placing well in these contests would do well, but even uh, the blacklist, isn't there sort of an artificial hype machine that kind of goes on with that where it's not truly like what they say? Like there seems to be like... Yeah, yeah. it's a lot of campaigning, I think, you know, from mm -hmm. agents and managers, mm -hmm. and they'll call us and be like, hey, you know, vote for our guy. We want him to be on the blacklist. But at the same time, when it comes out, everybody's like, oh my gosh, what's on there? And if I haven't read something, I have to read it, mm -hmm. you know? So there's sort of, I think the hype, I don't know, it, it is still real in that you will get attention from it. Um, it's just maybe not as authentic as it used to be. I used to work for the creator of the blacklist um, when he was. Well, why don't we talk about what it is, just in case somebody doesn't know yeah. what it is? You should know what it is, but it's it's kind of like um, it's not a best of list, but it's like you know, kind of a fav a list of yeah. of favorites of unproduced unproduced um, unproduced yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or yeah. not yet produced. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's like a, a list of scripts that's published every year. Uh, and at, at Disney, it was funny. We actually kind of had a contest to vote for what scripts we thought would be on the blacklist and you know we assigned points to it it was fun i actually got second place thank you very much <laughs> um but the reason why you can get second place is because we kind of already know because those phone calls are happening so hey let's vote for mine so i went and talked to my executive and i said well what scripts do you think are going to be on the blacklist and she gave me like six and i chose all six of them and they <laughs> all were in the top 10. so it's like it's not completely um what what 
you might think it is, but it's definitely something that will set you apart. You're going to get a lot of phone calls, you're going to get a lot of meetings, you're going to get a lot of opportunities to be represented if you're in the Nichols um, program, if you're on the blacklist, if you're on the, I think Blue Cat is another one mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of attention as well. Hopefully the, the DePaul thing that we have here will, you know, continue to gain traction and that can be something uh, that insiders are looking for for material. Anything to add, Lenny, about just how, right, just generating heat even, maybe, I mean, attachments, as we discussed, is a huge factor. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's like anything else. If this guy who's super talented likes your script, then that script must be good, mm -hmm. right? So your goal is to get whoever that super talented guy or girl or company or actor or director or someone, that's, the, you got to get into those type of hands in order to kind of vouch for you. Because that, that's really the, the end game to all this, is that if this guy, if Scott Free, you know, really Scott vouches for you, then it must be a good script, a good project. And, and, that's, the, and that's, that's pretty much that. You don't really need hype, you just need exposure, right? Mm -hmm. And to get exposure, uh, you, you just, you need elements. And elements are important, especially these days, you know? When it, Overbrook, for instance, if, Will, if it's coming out of Will Smith's company, it, it must be good, you know? And, and, and so you need to get it to Will Smith's company somehow. And it's funny, we keep a log, or we did when I was at Good Universe, of all the scripts that have come into the company over the last 15 years. And you'll see scripts that have been submitted several times. And this time, it has this actor, or this producer, uh, or this financier attached to it. It makes the whole difference, you know? What was a project that's not for us becomes a project that can potentially be for us in foreign sales, if not production or in some capacity. Um, so if someone loves your script and they have some heat to them, it might be nice to, to put those people together. Mm -hmm. Um, talk, since we were talking about attachments, is, is that a, a huge deciding factor for Scott Free when, when a project is coming in? If, if it has, what attach, or are they just assuming that you know, Ridley or somebody would be interested in it? Or do, do projects come in with already talent attached? Yeah, are, definitely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for us, I'm lucky to work at a company where it's really about the material. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in terms of the attachments conversation, sometimes it can be great, like um, a spec sold a couple years ago that had um, Emma Stone attached to it. And that generated a lot of heat because she was super hot at mm -hmm. the time and it was a big, you know, sort of comedy. And so that's perfect situation. Um, but then you have attachments that sometimes can kind of hinder the performance mm -hmm. um, because maybe that person has a bad reputation or isn't a very nice person or, um, Going against type would be a big thing, yeah. right? It might be a big name, but maybe not. And sometimes it can make something harder. So it, for us, it always comes down to the material and the attachments. Attachments also come and go. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that that person is going to do the movie. Right. So for us, we always we always base it off the material. You know, because that actor, that director, could fall off with the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. um, so we always, it's always great to have attachments, and you know that can like drive the excitement. Um, but for us, it kind of come down, comes down to the material. And I mean, technically, her company is the attachment. Yes, yeah. Yeah. right, yeah. That's yeah. The thing. Right, right, right. I mean, right. you know. And so it's more acting, though, looking for potential directing, right? In that case, pretend, right? Yeah. Like acting, acting might be attached to a project looking yeah. for directing. Well, I mean, somebody like, you know, their company, they could get any actor in the world yeah. to, mm -hmm. to be in there based on their reputation. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, they're the attachment. Will Smith's company is the mm -hmm. attachment. It's, it's when, you know, by going to them, that's what you're locking down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as, a, as someone who worked for a financier, if you want to partner with a more kind of established creative producer like her boss, then you, you can do that as well. So it's like, oh, now that they're attached, we want to invest in that film as well. So. Yeah, we're part of the hype machine. <laughs> part of the hype machine. <laughs> so um, we're going to be opening up to Q&A in just a minute, but I do want to touch on where do you guys see the industry sort of moving? Because there is such crossover now with streaming services and web and all this other stuff that's going on um, uh, with tele you know, the rise of TV being more viable property than it has been in the past. Where do you sort of see the industry sort of going? And, uh, or do you think it'll still have this sort of segregation between media, between platforms of film, I, just, TV? I mean, I, I think, you know, I think the, it's big budget 
huge movies, and I think it's really low budget uh, independent films. And that I don't think there's much of a middle ground. The, there's movies like The Hangover, which is an action comedy done for thirty million dollars, uh, you know, at Warner Brothers, where they take a risk on relatively three unknown guys, right? Uh, so that's why they keep money down. But when it comes to distribution, it, it's it's a double-edged sword, right? Because you make a movie for let's say a million bucks, you know, South Side of Chicago. You're really excited about it. Somebody buys that movie, and you have two, you you have two options. You could put it in theaters. Well, if you put that movie in theaters, you're gonna have to do a P&A commitment, and so all of a sudden that million dollar movie has has to put another four million dollars or three million dollars. So now you have to recoup five million dollars on a million dollar movie, or you do now, you know, a Netflix model, or you do a iTunes model, or even Vimeo now has a great situation where, you know, I, I did a documentary last year and I released it on Vimeo. It's a 90 10 split, meaning, you know, the filmmakers get 90% and uh, Vimeo gets 10%. So it's a really great profit situation. However, how do you make enough noise to get people to that site in order mm -hmm. to buy it? Mm -hmm. And then you as a group, have to really work marketing, social media, uh, everything to drive people there. And if you can, it's a big win. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's to the benefit of writers to become filmmakers um, at some level, right? So you look at a project like Broad City, right? You know, they start off these two-minute kind of webisodes and it gets the attention of Amy Poehler, and now you know they're talking to different uh, networks about their show. They end up at Comedy Central, and it does very well. You know, um, I think if you're a writer and there is some opportunity for you to produce some of your work as either a proof of concept of a larger project, or you know maybe it's a web series. I've seen so many people I know in Los Angeles turn their web series into development deals uh, at networks, or turn that into fundraising campaigns for their independent films. Uh, I think writers have to think about ways that they can make their smaller projects happen uh, to make it real to people. So if you go into a, a, a general meeting, um, you can have something uh, that's real for the executive to attach to and to like. And so when they go into that weekly meeting with their boss and say, hey, let me send you this, this YouTube clip of something I'm really excited about. And that's something that they can understand and then they, they can make a move on. So. Yeah, and for writers specifically, like, you don't even necessarily have to have a video. Like having a blog that has mm. so many hits can maybe not directly translate into a screenwriting you know, uh, opportunity. But you've got publishers out there always looking for, like, based on a blog, 50 million people, like, <laughs> checked into the site or whatever. And then that kind of can circle back into film. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can, you can take to generate interest in yourself as a content creator. Mm -hmm. And sometimes pigeonholing yourself, like, I'm just I'm writing features. Or I'm going to write 10 pilots and see which one, you know, takes hold. You know, there's definitely a whole bunch of different ways to to get inter people interested in you which it should be the goal you know it's not you you're the creator so mm -hmm. to the, I mean to that note it's you know it's intellectual property I mean whether it's a blog a clip a book an article if you're able to establish intellectual property for yourself then your work is worth that much more uh, a, a good example there there was a blog called anonymous lawyer that was posted in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago and it's a kid who uh, you know finished Harvard Law School, didn't want to go, didn't want to be a lawyer. Started a blog about a hiring partner at one of the biggest firms. Obviously, it was all false. And the Wall Street Journal picked it up, started writing it. Then he got a book deal based on the blog. Then from that book deal, uh, WME started representing him, and he ended up getting a pilot deal to, and co-wrote a pilot for NBC called an Anonymous Lawyer. And you know, and you know, he's a screenwriter now. So it really worked out for him in a big way. So I think we're going to be opening up for questions. Yeah. So no, <laughs> I thought he said. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we can. 
this, I have a five word question. Oh, actually, I think we are using yeah, but the I have to interrupt question. all these people for five words. Mm -hmm. I just would like to know, Lenny, uh, what is a lookbook? You should develop a lookbook. Like uh, okay, a lookbook is just, you know, a lookbook is a visual palette of what the movie is going to look like, right? So, for instance, uh, I'm shooting a movie right now in London called Bone of Throat. It's, a, it's a based on Anthony Bourdain book, right? Uh, and so what, what I have is front page, title of the movie, who's in it. And then what you do is, you know, the actors that you, want, the actors that you might want to play a certain role. You ha it's, uh, it's based in a restaurant. So we have food and we have uh, restaurants and we have, it just gives you a pretty much a visual palette of the movie. There's a, a summary. There'll be a summary in there. Uh, so it's, it's that kind of vibe. It's an expanded treatment, kind of. Yeah, pretty, yeah, I would say that. I mean, it's, but it's all, the reason it's a lookbook is because it's, it's all visual. So it's not that, you don't want to put too many words into it. So storyboard, expanded storyboard. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Maybe yeah. like a visual treatment. Yeah. yeah. Kind of thing. And I've seen, the great thing about lookbooks is they, they're material that you can kind of call from anywhere, right? So a lot of times they're like high resolution images that you can get on the internet. It's like, oh, this is the feel of it. You know, this is the theme and th these are the colors I'm gonna use and these are the kind of shots that I want. And then that makes it more real. The video kind of equivalent is like a sizzle reel, which is like, you know, different clips put together to, to you know, kind of show what the movie would, would, would feel like and look like maybe. Yeah, and all these materials are helping the executive, the producer, the studio see the movie in the script, it's to elevate it and help them bridge the gap and you know the selling point because they have to sell it to their boss ultimately, mm -hmm. the head of the studio. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a chain effect. Mm -hmm. So all of it is to help you know create energy and excitement behind the project. Uh, so I just wanted to go back to one of the first things that was said on the panel uh, about a producible script. Lenny, you said you look for a male lead, but given the success of films like The Hunger Games and Frozen, and even going back almost 10 years ago to a film like Juno that was mentioned on this panel. Don't you think that's a little antiquated to look for a male lead as uh, a producer? You know what? I, I appreciate you naming those three movies, right? But mm. I could give you probably a million others. <laughs> sure. That, I, that not. Now, now see, the, the movies you guys know, most of you, right, are in 3,000 theaters, right? Uh, which, is, which is great. Now, to get, and the movies that I know, right, that you go to the American film market, you go to Cannes, you go to all these other uh, markets, uh, there's movies that you don't, you don't see because they don't get worldwide distribution. They don't get big distribution. But as a writer, if you are a produced writer and somebody could go see your movie somewhere, uh, then you're, re you're, you're winning, right? So what happens is to get those independent movies made, you need to have foreign sales, right? Foreign sales is, you know, a group of people that go to Cannes and say, hey, we have John Malkovich and Tim Roth and, uh, you know, uh, Christopher Walken in a movie, right? Now, all three guys are great actors, but they're not big stars. But in the combination of all those guys together, you, equal, you could probably raise about two million bucks, right? So now two million bucks and a contained thriller will get the movie financed. And if the director does a good job, he might get distribution for that film, right? So the movie Juno, for example, you know, the movie gets made not because of Ellen Page. The movie gets paid because Jason Reitman did a movie that, Thank You for Smoking, that had Aaron Eckhart, a male lead, and the movie performed really well, so he's able to now make this movie, and then he's able to make a movie with Charlize Theron, who is one of probably 10 big female stars. But that's the, pr I mean, the issue is that I'm not being a genderist of any <laughs> sort. It's just the nature of the beast. Would you say, but is Sarah, like it's Scott Free, they, you wouldn't like specifically, for, from their view though, you wouldn't turn down a project because it had a female lead, right? You, like if it had a good story, I, that's not a deal breaker, right? You're just like, oh, female lead, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, Lenny's point's valid though, because you're talking about international markets of smaller yeah. films. But I'm talking about putting yeah, a movie together. Right. Yeah, right. I that's think all. in terms of like, if you, as a writer, if you want to have a female lead, the smart, if you have like, you're really passionate about a certain character that you see coming to life, I think the smart thing to do is to set that in a pretty commercial world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, make it a thriller, because we don't, 
that's sort of a gap. We don't have a lot of female serial killers out there, and that's something that, <laughs> or you know, like base it on a on a true story or something that can kind of that has the commercial appeal that maybe the female lead doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of balance the project if you choose to to go in that direction. Okay. Uh, I got a question for uh, Mr. Willis. Uh, what kind of research and like do you have to do is like signing on to like an already like well-established show with you know characters and plots that have been developed and relationships that have already been built. Mm -hmm. Coming on now, a couple seasons later, like what what kind of homework do you have to do for yourself to really kind of get involved with such like a an audience that knows what to expect for every episode? How mm -hmm. do you go about that? Taking that um, job. Yeah, yeah. First off, it's Dan, but thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I when, when I started the interview process with Grey's Anatomy, I immediately started binge watching the show. So. I was lucky it was on Netflix, so I started from wherever I left off way back when and just start watching everything I could. And then I went online and I started pulling scripts of that show so I could read the show and read how they put that together. Um, and then just being present when I'm there, it's like I'm continuing to watch as I go. I'm continuing to kind of talk to the writers that I've met and you know, as they create what's gonna be next season's um, arts, I'm paying attention to those things and trying to you know, reach back into what they've already done. Uh, so just a lot of watching uh, television and reading as much as I can. Was it ever a, a time where you'd watch it and you'd think, oh, if I were already signed on to this, I would have probably done it differently. I would have made a different arc or, or some kind of, were you already putting in your two cents while you were going in and doing your initial research of the show? I mean, you think about those things, but I think with television and being a staff writer, you want to think about how they've done things, especially a show that's been on the air for 10 years. It's like you're trying to come into the fold, right? So, you know, a lot of times people will write um, spec screen or spec episodes of television uh, that's already on the air. You want to approach those like, you know, this is how they do their show and I want to kind of bring whatever I have to offer within those boundaries, right? Um, so I don't want to start killing off characters or you know, like making them do things that they would never do. You got to kind of get an understanding on what the world is and work within those boundaries. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely more of a hired gun situation, right? Where you have to sort of know what, mm -hmm. understand the vision of the showrunner and try to facilitate that. Or exactly. That. And if you look at like if you do your research <laughs> and you go on IMDB or IMDB Pro or whatever, you can see a lot of these writers bounce around. So they might work on this show for two years and then go work on True Blood or go work on Breaking Bad or whatever it is. So you just come in there and you're there to do your work in service of the show uh, and then, you know, potentially move on to something else. Um, hi guys, my name is Joe. Um, my question is, we talked a lot about the importance of representation. What are some of the do's and don'ts of getting represented by either an agent or a manager? Uh, uh, the don'ts, uh, don't harass, right? Nobody wants to be harassed. Uh, be, uh, be patient, you know? Uh, there's, uh, people are flooded with scripts all the time, you know? Uh, you, can't, you have to do your job. You also have to have some sense of a social life. So you know you got to get be patient. Um, those are you know those are those are kind of you know don't do that. The the do's is you know just write good stuff. You know I mean also little updates. You know it's like oh I got a you know I got a piece in the McSweeney or I got this going on. I got this going on. So you know it's like it's like dating a girl, right? You know. If you're overly aggressive or you're too pushy, the girl's not going to be that into you, right? Mm -hmm. So you try to be a little standoffish, you try to be cool, calm and collective, <laughs> and, let, and let your writing or who you are speak for itself. Thank you. That's scary. I you say the same thing in class. It's very scary. <laughs> right but uh, no, I think there is some truth to it, though, because if you are overly aggressive, and I don't think a lot of writers, too, understand how much time it does take to get a response sometimes, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not interested in it. It's just that, you know, if, again, if you don't have the heat behind you, there's no urgency. It's not like you've got, you, know, you, you could be in a bidding war with Paramount or something, right? It's like this project could, in theory, sit for another six months, you know, if, if no one's, you know what I mean? Like there. Well, I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of projects that don't get made for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this movie I'm working on now, you know, that's finally shooting. I mean, I've been working on it for three years, you know, and 
what happens is a lot of writers get so impatient that they think, oh, it's taken too long, that they might pull a project from a producer to try to give it to another producer, thinking they're going to have better luck, or, and, and that's a disadvantage to writers. You know? yeah. the, the other thing uh, with the dating sort of analogy thing is, uh, uh, maybe really quick before we get to the next question, is just talk about like, how writers have to be able to accept rejection, because that's a huge part of it. And I think that sometimes, you know, if you take that initial script out there, it gets rejected by one place, and all of a sudden it's like, my career's over. <laughs> and it's it's you know everybody gets rejected, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean rejection's part of everything, yeah. abso absolutely. And I think, I think the thing is that you have to accept criticism. Okay, criticism is a big deal, and it happens every single day. And the thing is that if you take criticism the right way, you'll get you'll become a better writer. You'll take notes. You'll make a better script. And in that scenario, people will reread it if you take their notes and do it. If you take criticism the wrong way and say, oh, those guys don't know anything, this industry is screwed, you know, I'm out of here, then, you know, you're, you're, you're done. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to know that the criticism aspect of it continues throughout your entire career. Mm -hmm. Like, you can be triple A list writer and you're still going to get criticism. You're still going to get notes. You're still going to be asked to make cuts. And so having a tough skin is really important. And but also, you know, it's it's part of the game, so you mm -hmm. kind of have to like get ready for it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I've been using the the guide for Hollywood directors and producers, and what I'm told in the phone calls is I try to jump right in. I've got a page quarter finalist. I've got blah blah blah, and I try and jump in with credentials. But what I keep getting told is legally we're not allowed to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So how do you get it to the next step? How do you actually reach someone someone like you, or how do you? Yeah. Well, there's a catch-22, right? Of like, you can't bring a script to a production company or a studio unless you have an agent or a manager, and you typically can't get an agent or a manager unless you have a studio or a production company interested in your script. So, how do you, how do you get beyond that catch-22? I mean, you know, it, my best advice to that is, you know, is is try to find a manager of some sort. You know, somebody to advocate you. You know, uh, I think cold calling, with is is probably not the way to go because what happens is that they don't have people don't have time to take the calls and and most of the people you're talking to are assistants and they just got to get through the day and the phone calls so so what so what it is is that you know the contests are a great way to to get noticed and you know and also just trying to get you know send log lines you know log lines are the best things ever you know I mean there's a script that I have in development you know, this writer, you know, randomly sent me this log line, and I was like, wow, that sounds pretty good. And so he sent, you know, so I, I, I took the, the script, and I read it, and it was awful. Uh, but I loved the idea. So mm -hmm. 10 drafts later with this guy, uh, you know, we have a really interesting director on board and contained little erotic thriller kind of in the vein of Black Swan. And so... You know, he got his chance with a great log line. I mean, you know, you, you got to be a salesperson. So, so if you're a great writer, that log line should be pretty great. And you, are you getting those log lines in the form of a query email or uh, an actual letter that somebody's mailing to you? No, how, no, how no are you I receiving mean, these uh, you know, I get emails, but yeah. there's also these script contests and these yeah. certain things that filter a lot of this stuff out. And I'm subscribed to a few of them. And mm -hmm. so every morning I'll, I'll get a handful of log lines that I'll just peruse quickly and if you know if anything strikes my fancy great I so mean, you will read query letters then I will read log lines <laughs> uh, no, that's what I tell them to like and, it's, and it's, you know it's, you know hey it's World War II and it's you know a sweeping epic you know sorry mm -hmm. I'm not the guy for that because mm -hmm. that's you know a first-time writer is not gonna be able to get that movie sold what I, I think the trouble is there enough like one or two success stories every year that encourages people to continue to send blind submissions and I just I wouldn't recommend it either even as an intern it was my job to get rid of them um, <laughs> and like really good companies will send you a note back saying exactly what they're saying you know for legal reasons we don't uh, accept unsolicited material but a lot of times they either just go in the shredder or you know they're just not seen again. Um, so if you're not in Los Angeles, I would really, you know, look out, go to the blacklist.com, which is something that is like, you know, I think gaining momentum 
Uh, you can post your screenplays there. If people read them, they can kind of get rated and, and kind of bumped up a little bit. There's a, a, a DePaul alum whose who script like made the top 10 list uh, on that site, so that's something. Um, I think the contests are good as well, but just sending in like blind submissions and calls, I don't think is the best use of your time. Well, are there agents that you would recommend that you could use for as a new writer? Someone without a reputation in, in the industry? Um, I what don't. What's your ask? Agent? She, she was wanting to know the names of, I think, an agent that would represent a new writer. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, obviously the bigger agencies are not really going to, you know, uh, sign a new writer. So I think that the best bet is to look. And, and find small agencies that might might take a chance, you know. At the, at the same time, you know, it's it's these contests that are really going to get you noticed. It's it's what we were saying earlier is that instead of you being the one being the hunter, be the be the hunty, you mm -hmm. know, have them look for you. And get people excited about your work and don't always look to the very top. It's like the president of production is not going to read your script, you know. But if you develop a relationship with an assistant at the company, then they might read your script. And then if they really like it and they're one of those kind of enterprising assistants who wants to get a promotion at the company, who wants to be a junior executive or a senior executive, they're going to pass it up to their boss and they're going to advocate and say, hey, look what I found for our company. You know, this is someone who doesn't have representation yet. Um, so these th things like that, it's like I wouldn't always shoot for the stars. You know, when I was at Disney, we would have submissions that go straight to Alan Horn. It's like, yeah. okay, <laughs> nice, but you know, I'm gonna read that script. So it's like, I would use the people you can get to and try to get people ex mm -hmm. excited about yeah, your work. The networking component is so important because mm -hmm. even I think another way is to go the internship route. And if you start making friends with the assistants and things, then sort of sometimes they'll have you sign off on a waiver agreement, and then you can have your stuff read mm -hmm. uh, rather than going through the traditional agent manager route. But yeah, and I mean, in this whole conversation, like moving to LA costs money, and I can tell you that you're not going to meet more people than you will if you are an assistant. Mm -hmm. So you know you can get trapped in being pushed into the development route if you choose to become an assistant but if you can stay focused on your writing and you know work 23 hours a day like do your job and then go home and write during the day you're going to be answering the phone and scheduling but you're also going to be meeting aspiring agents you're going to be talking to junior agents junior managers it's just a way to kind of keep yourself afloat and if you can stay focused and not get sidetracked by like the LA scene and the Hollywood assistance game you know that's a good way to build relationships with people and and get them to trust you trust your taste and then eventually say I've been working on this and would you mind taking a look at it I'd really appreciate you know your notes or something like that Great. Well, I think we're out of time. So thank you to Lenny, Sarah, and Dan for coming. Appreciate it.